Welcome to the third video in our series on cost volume profit analysis. In our last video, we considered a company that only made a single product. This is unlikely to be realistic, so in this video, we will look at multi product CVP. Our learning objectives for this video are first to understand when it is appropriate to apply multi product CVP analysis. Next, we want to revisit our underlying CVP assumptions and understand which assumptions are critical to multi-product CVP. Thirdly, we want to explore the steps in multi-product CVP analysis and apply these to a basic example. Finally, we want to be able to calculate the margin of safety in a multi-product setting. So when do we apply multi-product CVP? As we saw in our previous video, basic CVP analysis deals with a company or division that manufactures a single product. Such a situation doesn't always apply in real life, as many companies or divisions make multiple products. So multi-product CVP analysis extends the basic analysis to deal with the situation. Therefore, as soon as we have a situation with more than one product, we need to apply multi-product CVP. Now let's consider the key assumptions of multi-product CVP analysis. The basic assumptions are on screen. While all these assumptions still need to hold true, I want to highlight two assumptions in particular. The first is that we need to have a constant sales mix. The sales mix enables us to create a weighted contribution and then determine the break-even point. If the sales mix changes, it means that our weighted contribution would either increase or decrease. If the weighted contribution increases, it will decrease our break-even point. However, if the weighted contribution decreases, it will increase the break-even point. The second assumption I want to highlight is that profits are calculated on the variable costing basis. Under variable costing, we don't allocate fixed costs to the individual products. Rather, we treat fixed costs as a period cost and expense them immediately. A common mistake I see among students who perform multi-product CVP analysis is that they violate this assumption by trying to allocate the fixed costs to individual products. Now that we understand when to apply multi-product CVP analysis and the key assumptions, let us consider the five steps in multi-product CVP analysis. Our first step is to calculate the contribution per unit for each product. Remember here that contribution is calculated as the selling price less all variable costs where all variable costs include the production and non-production variable costs. Step two is then to calculate the sales mix. This calculation can be done as either a ratio or a proportion. We will work through these alternatives in an example. Next, our third step is to calculate the weighted average contribution. The value of this contribution may differ based on how you perform step two. In step four, we apply our standard break-even formula to calculate the break-even batches. Finally, in step five, we take the break-even batches and using the sales mix we calculated in step two, we convert the batches back into individual product units. Now let's look at an example to see how these steps work. Pause the video and work through the example on screen on your own. Once you have completed it, unpause the video and we'll do it together. Great, so keep your answer in front of you and let's see how you did. Our first step was to calculate the contribution per unit for each product. Remember, contribution is our selling price less all variable costs. This is easy in this example as the scenario tells us our selling price and variable costs for each product. 
So we get a contribution of 50 Rand for product A, 75 Rand for product B, and 15 Rand for product C. Our second step is to calculate each product's weighting in the sales mix. Here we have two options. We can either calculate it as a proportion or percentage, or we can calculate it as a ratio. With sufficient experience, you will see that both of these methods are actually the same. However, some people understand one method better than the other. While we will work through both in this example, you should select one method that you are comfortable with and stick to it. Let us begin with the proportion method. Here we are effectively expressing the sales units for each product as a percentage of total sales. If we follow this approach, we will see that product A is 0.625 or 62,5% of total sales. Product B is 25% of total sales and product C is 12.5% of total sales. Here I have expressed the proportion as a decimal to show that we are effectively creating a batch of one unit. This concept will become more important later on when we unpack various aspects of the calculation. Under the ratio method, we are expressing our sales in terms of the lowest common factor. If we look at our sales, we see that product C has the smallest sales units of 250. If we take 250 and divide by 250, we get 1. We can now divide product A and product B by 250 to get 5 units and 2 units respectively. This gives us a total batch size of 8 units. Our third step is to calculate the weighted average contribution. We need to be careful here and make sure we stick with the method we chose in step 2 being either the proportion or the ratio. If we start with the proportion method, we simply take the contribution and multiply it by the proportion to get the weighted contribution. So as an example, if we take product A's contribution of 50 Rand and multiply it by its proportion in the sales mix of 62,5%, we arrive at a weighted contribution of 31 Rand and 25 cents. We do the same for products B and C and arrive at a total weighted contribution of 51 Rand, 875. Now let's consider the ratio method. Here we follow the same idea. We take the contribution and multiply it by the product's component in the ratio. So as an example, if we take product A's contribution and multiply it by its component in the sales ratio of 5, we arrive at a weighted contribution of 250 Rand. We do the same for products B and C and arrive at a total weighted contribution of 415 Rand. Notice something interesting here. If we divide the 415 Rand by the 51 Rand, 875, we arrive at a value of 8. This shows us that the 51 Rand, 875 represents a batch of one unit, while the 415 Rand represents a batch of eight units. Our fourth step is to calculate the break-even batches. Here we use our standard break-even formula. However, instead of using the individual product contribution, we use the weighted contribution. So for the proportion method, we take our fixed costs, of 62,250 Rand and divided by our weighted contribution of 51 Rand, 875 to arrive at a break even point of 1,200 batches. If we use the ratio method, we divide our fixed costs of 62,250 Rand by our weighted contribution of 415 Rand to arrive at 150 batches. Notice again that if we take the 1,200 batches and divide by the 150 batches, we arrive at a value of 8. Once we have calculated our break-even batches, our first step is to convert them from the batches back 
into the individual product units. To do this, we simply multiply our break-even batches by the proportion or the ratio. So if we are applying the proportion method, we take our break-even batches of 1,200 and multiply by the proportion of 0.625 for product A, 0.25 for product B, and 0.125 for product C. We then arrive at our individual units of 750 for A, 300 for B, and 150 for C. We do the same for the ratio method. Here we take our batches of 150 and multiply by 5 for product A, 2 for product B, and 1 for product C. This gives us 750 units of A, 300 units of B, and 150 units of C. So both methods have given us the identical answer. Remember, you can apply all the same techniques for multi-product CVP that we did for single product CVP. You can calculate the extra units if you have a target profit to be met, or you can perform sensitivity analysis. Once we know how to calculate our break-even point using multi-product CVP, we can calculate the margin of safety. There are three methods to calculate the margin of safety. First, we could use the total number of units produced. While this method does work, it is not conceptually correct, as you can't add different products. However, when we look at the solution, we will see why this method does work. The second method is to use the batches produced. Finally, our last method is to use the total sales revenue. Both these methods are conceptually correct, as we are comparing like terms. All batches have the same mix and are therefore uniform. Total revenue is all expressed in the same currency and is therefore uniform. So let's do an example. Pause the video and give it a try. When you are ready, unpause and we will work through it together. Great, so you now have your answer. Let's begin by seeing what we know. Because we are dealing with budgeted information, we know that the margin of safety is calculated as the budgeted sales less the break-even sales, all divided by the budgeted sales. We have three methods to calculate our margin of safety. Note that I have split the batches option into both the proportion and the ratio. Let us begin with the units. Here our budgeted units are the sum of the unit sales of each product provided to us in the initial scenario. This totals 2,000 units. Our break-even sales, then, are the sum of our individual break-even units, which we just calculated. Again, this method is conceptually incorrect, because you cannot add one unit of product A with one unit of product B. You cannot add two apples with three bananas and get five banapples. Now, if we use these numbers in our margin of safety formula, we do arrive at a margin of safety of 40%. Let's move on to our batches using the proportion method. Remember, our break-even batches was 1,200 batches under step 4 earlier. Notice that this is identical to the break-even units under the unit method. If we add 2 apples with 3 bananas, we don't get 5 banapples but we do get five fruit. Remember what I said earlier. Under the proportion method, our batch is effectively one unit, representing 0.625 of product A, 0.25 of product B, and 0.125 of product C. Therefore, our break-even batches using the proportion method will be the same as our break-even units if we use the unit method. Our budgeted batches is then 2,000, based on the same logic. This is why simply adding the units together works, even though it is conceptually incorrect. Now, if we calculate our margin of safety, we arrive again at 40%. Next, we can use our batches using the ratio method. Our break-even batches is what we calculated under step 4. 
To calculate our budgeted sales batches, we can take any of our product's budgeted sales and divide it by its component in the ratio. So remember, our ratio was 5A is to 2B is to 1C, to give us a total batch size of 8. If we divide the budgeted sales of A of 1,250 by 5, we arrive at 250. If we divide the 500 sales of B by 2, we arrive at 250. If we divide the 250 sales of C by 1, we arrive at 250. Finally, if we divide the total sales of 2,000 units by 8, we arrive at 250. All of these options give us our batches of 250. Using these numbers in our margin of safety formula, we arrive at a margin of safety of 40%. Finally, we can use our sales revenue. In this example, the budgeted sales revenue of 237,500 Rand was given to us in the scenario. To calculate our break-even sales revenue, we take the individual break-even units for each product and multiply it by the selling price per unit and then sum to arrive at 142,500 Rand. Again, we arrive at 40% when calculating our margin of safety. Any of these methods will give you the final margin of safety of 40%. This brings us to the end of our video on multi-product CVP analysis. In our next video, we will look at operating leverage. See you next time.